Kevin and I were 17 when we started dating. I was in high school, and he worked at McDonald's, and for our first Christmas, he got me a necklace that said Foxy. And my grade 12 self was just completely mortified at the thought that I would have to wear this in public, but little did either of us know at the time that Kevin would go on to become a goldsmith. Now, thankfully for the health of our company, Kev's taste in jewelry has come a long way since then. And today, we design and build custom one-off pieces for our clients around the world. But in addition to our studio work, we've also developed a passion for mining policy, particularly in regards to artisanal and small-scale mining, or ASM. These are individuals that work on their own or as part of a small cooperative as opposed to large-scale industrial mining operations. And while they're only responsible for producing about 20% of the world's gold and diamonds, they make up over 90% of the workforce. Over 100 million people are dependent on ASM for their livelihood globally. This is Paolo and his two sons in Ecuador. When we asked them about mine collapses, they told us that there had been four since the beginning. And I thought that meant four since mining began in the region in 1850, but something was lost in translation. And what they meant was that their current mine had four collapses since they began on that site nine months previously. The mine on the right is Paolo's mine. The entrance is about this high, and it's actually relatively sophisticated. The two mines on the right are typical artisanal mines, and they're little more than a foxhole. ASM is also the primary cause of mercury pollution in the world. Miners use mercury to help remove the gold from the ore, from the rock, and subsequently they burn it off so that they're only left with metal. As a result, many miners and their families are also victims of mercury poisoning. Mercury remains in the ore after it's been processed, and this is generally dumped into local waterways. Here, two rivers converge, but upstream to the right are 17 gold processing plants. You can see the concentration of ore in the water. Downstream, birth defects, developmental disabilities, and cancer is rampant. It's estimated that there's over a million kids working in ASM. The World Label Organization has deemed artisanal mining to be the single worst form of child labor that exists. What's particularly horrifying is that kids are often recruited to work in the smallest mines because it's easier for them to access than adults. This is a pop-up mining town, Ponce Enrique. While we were working there, uh, Colombian paramilitary groups had come in and set up their own microfinancing programs, whereby they would lend miners loans, and if a miner went for more than a week without making a payment, they would be killed. Needless to say, the tension here is palpable. Today, this gold closed at just over $86,000. And once cut, this diamond will wholesale for just over $75,000. Either one of these is enough to finance 30 teachers for five years in Central Africa. These are just a couple of reasons why Kevin and I believe that it's so important to advocate for artisanal miners. Seven years ago, before we started working together, I saw the chief technical advisor to the United Nations Industrial Development Organization speak on mercury use in gold mining. And so I went home and told Kev, there's this guy, he's doing some really interesting work. You might want to look into how it relates to the jewelry sector. And so Kev was like, all right, well, I'll give him a call and I'll take him out for a beer. And I said, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that's not how you're supposed to approach senior advisors to the UN. <laughs> and Kev said, no, trust me, this will be fine. <laughs> and sure enough, a couple of pints later, we found ourselves working on the project that would eventually become Fairtrade Gold. Fairtrade is currently the only independently certified, traceable, transparent supply of gold in the world. Artisanal miners are given access to the global market at global prices, and the gold is mined using safe and sustainable practices with no child labor. We're one of two jewelers in North America who are certified to use the gold. The vast majority of ASM miners are unregistered and unprotected. And so for this reason, we also work on property rights projects. When miners own the rights to mine a piece of property, they're uh, less vulnerable to violence and extortion, and there's more incentive for them to rehabilitate the land. Currently, we're also working to create a direct trade model. Miners are given direct access to international buyers, and they're also trained and supported in diamond evaluation and sustainable mining practices as tools for poverty reduction and community development.
Now, working on these projects come with their own unique set of challenges, not least of which is security. Here in the Central African Republic, we travel with a presidential guard, basically 11 guys with AK-47s, and on multiple occasions, we found ourselves in regions where our travel insurance has been void. <laughs> Animals also come with their own logistical issues. We've run into these beauties in Africa, alligators in the jungle in Colombia, we've had snakes in our office, and toads in our toilets, and we've had elephants eat all of the mangoes from one of our agricultural initiatives. <laughs> Culture remains to be one of the most interesting factors. For example, voodooism is alive and well in Central Africa. Mama Wati is a spirit that will seduce you to come into the water, and she's generally blamed for most deaths and accidents when miners dive into rivers to get gravel. This can make conversations around work safety even more difficult. <laughs> now, we are a very small business, but what we lack in numbers and capital, we make up for in agility. We're not bound to shareholders, we have fewer internal politics when we can get past things like laundry, and we're able to implement change immediately. This has allowed us to set the precedent and create a new norm for our industry. Finally, when we talk about design in international development, it tends to be in the context of design for development, creating a product or service to improve the quality of life or raise funds for others. And while sourcing supply chain and policy issues are not sexy, they do have the potential to affect systemic change for a lot of people. And it's for this reason that we also need to consider design as development. Thank you.